you, as, as I understand it, had an office, I believe, directly across the hall or, or close to <laughs> Dr. Jordan Peterson. And my question is, where, with respect to the finding or creation of meaning, or meaning, mm -hmm. broadly speaking, where would you say you most strongly, the two of you most strongly agree, and where do you most strongly disagree? Way before Jordan became a god, Jordan <laughs> and I, we used to regularly show up at conferences, we shared students a lot. We, we, we had some public debates, I mean, in the proper good sense. Mm -hmm. And so Jordan shares with me this, this idea of relevance realization as a, as a core problem to be explained and understood. And that, that the relevance realization gives us that sense of religio, that sense of connectedness, because we're, it's how we're coupled non-propositionally to the world. You know, we've already talked about this. Jordan and I share that a lot. And he's very, very interested and often supportive of the work I do on relevance realization, intelligence, consciousness, meaning, and the cultivation of wisdom. And so that's where we have some very significant agreements. He places more emphasis on the narrative, on narrative, than I do. I think non-narrative, I think narrative is very important. I want to make that very clear. I don't, I don't think we become temporally extended moral agents without narrative. But I think their narrative depends on pre-narrative dialogical capacities, and we can move post-narrative, because this is what many people in wisdom traditions, mystical traditions report. They move post-narrative. And you see techniques for getting people to go post-narrative. Like, think about the Zen Cohen. It's designed to get you into a narrative and then break narrative apart. Or Jesus of Nazareth's parables. That's, they sound like stories, and there's a narrative, and you read the prodigal son, and then, who am I supposed to identify with? Who's right? Like, mm -hmm. is, it the, is it the father? Is it the prodigal son? Is it the el And you realize if you settle on any one of those, you haven't got it, and it blows the narrative apart. You know, and Jesus, sorry, this sounds pretentious, I mean it respectfully, Jesus is a master of saying these things that sort of blow people apart, mm -hmm. right? Blow the narrative apart. So I, I think he, and we have done this publicly, he and I had a discussion with Jonathan Pajot, and, you know, I, and I was challenging Jonathan and Jordan about the emphasis on the narrative. And that, of course, comes from Jordan, from his, his Jungian background, and from Jonathan, from his Eastern Orthodox. Although Jonathan, to give him due credit, came around later and he released a, a video where he said, John's right, the nomological is not reducible to the narrative. There's ways in which we connect to reality that are non-narrative and are important. And I thought that was really good of him. So that'd be one area where Jordan and I disagree. Do you have to get the narrative before you can go post-narrative? I think so. I think so. And, and, and this is where I think the difference is. I think that narrative is indispensable, but I do not think that means it's metaphysically necessary. Let me mm -hmm. give you an analogy. My only language that I'm fluent in is English. English is indispensable to me being a cognitive agent and communicating. But I wouldn't claim it is metaphysically necessary that every cognitive agent speak in English and only in English or, or has to know English. You know, that's ridiculous. See, so you have to make a distinction between indispensability, and I think narrative is developmentally indispensable, but I don't think it's metaphysically necessary mm -hmm. to, our, to the full development of our cognition. Okay, so you have that disagreement. You have different weighting of narrative and yep. the alter not the alternative, but the term that you mentioned your your colleague used. The nomological, having to do with like the law like structures. Of, the law like structures of reality. There we go. Laws and theories are powerful and important in a way that's not reducible to narratives, right? That's one area. And then another area is I put a lot more emphasis on practices and theorizing and helping to engineer practices and ecology of practices than Jordan does. Hmm. That's another major difference. Why do you think that is? What would his response to that be, would you imagine? Part of it, I think, in fairness to him, is background. And part of it has to do, I think, with Jordan is a very complex person. I respect Jordan, I consider him a colleague, and I consider him a friend. And what I want to say very clearly, and I, and I do this to his face, by the way, and because I do it respectfully and dialogically, Jordan is fine with this. We disagree about things. For example, I think 
postmodernism and Derrida and Foucault, there's a lot to be learned there. I have criticisms of them, but there are important arguments that need to be engaged with. I have argued this with Jordan to his face. He disagrees. He thinks that postmodernism is largely crypto-Marxism, et cetera, et cetera, and he rejects it sort of to core. I'm not, I'm not denying that, that postmodernism has been taken by people in this way, but I would also say that many people invoke Derrida and Foucault, and they've not actually read Derrida and Foucault. <laughs> Derrida was very interested in Neoplatonism, and Foucault was very interested toward, in Hadot and Stoicism towards the end of his career. And there's reasons for that. I think you have to have a much more nuanced understanding of postmodernism. Now, I've made that argument to Jordan, and, he, and we disagree about it. But because I respect him, and we enter into genuine dialogue, that's fine, right? Now, the, the problem is, Jordan also has this other side where, and he doesn't do this with me where he gets, he, he's very confrontational, and he admits this, and he gets very polemical, and it's usually in the political domain, and that's, that's an area when he and I don't agree very much. But to his credit, right, you know, Jordan respects that he and I can have significant different political commitments, and nevertheless, get into deep and important discussions of philosophical and scientific merit. I have to say that because I, I'm really tired of people saying that because I talk to Jordan and because I maintain the relationship that pre-existed his godhood, that I am somehow, you know, advising or advocating for all of everything he says. That's ridiculous. I directly criticize him about a lot of things. It's just, I think it should be done in the way that we do it, and we've always done it. And so, that's a hard thing. My relationship yeah. to him is a challenge for me. I've considered both options. I've considered sort of just sort of throwing in, and I'm part of the Petersonian camp. And it's like, no, I can't do that. I can't do that in all honesty. I disagree with Jordan about politics as the main area. I disagree for philosophical reasons with Jordan about politics being the main area in which we can solve the meaning crisis. Politics is at the propositional level and is at the adversarial level. We need the we need the non-propositional. That's the main place where the meaning crisis is going to be addressed, I would argue. I disagree with him about that. I disagreed with him about particular philosophical stances like his stance on postmodernism, etc. And so Completely identifying him would be inauthentic. Completely rejecting him would be inauthentic. We share a lot of concerns. We, I admire many of his ideas. I think he's made, he's done good work, published work. He continues to make good arguments. He's an insightful person, and I have an ongoing history with him. And he he talks to people that I talk to, like so. I'm in this. I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't. So I I sort of just say, well, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to show up and interact with him as philosophically and scientifically, honestly, as I can. Yeah, I had Jordan on, on this podcast, and it was incredible to see how strongly binary, not just the He's responses were. He's a polarizing were, guy. Yeah, but also the expectations of me were, are you all in or are you all out? And there was part of me that wanted to say, this is this is the kind of identity politics morass that we have as yes. such an issue to have any kind of reconciliation and civil debate it can't be well i'm making a strong statement but like it shouldn't be shouldn't have to be that black or white i think there there are many I want to strengthen your argument for you. I want to strengthen your argument. <laughs> Please, I need someone to do okay. this with me more regularly. <laughs> this has to do with adaptivity. This has to do with intelligence. Let's just give you an example of relevance realization right now, right here, right now. Mm -hmm. You have two attentional systems, probably more, but at least these two, right? You have the task focus that is trying to keep you focused on what what, what is John saying with his multisyllabic complex sentences. <laughs> and then there's a part of you, the default mode network, that's mind-wandering. And I'm not accusing you of anything. It's drifting away. It's mm -hmm. thinking about other things. And they're, they're locked together, like evolution. The mind-wandering introduces variation. You The task network kills most of it off, but some of it survives and helps reproduce 
the conversation and keep it going. Mm -hmm. Opponent processing, your autonomic nervous system about arousal, sympathetic is biased to arousing you. Parasympathetic is biased to getting you to calm down. And they're locked together in opponent processing. You find this all through adaptive systems, opponent processing. Democracy. I argued this when I gave a talk at the in the international symposium on democracy in Prague in in September. Right? Democracy should be opponent processing. The best way for me to correct my perspectival bias is to have you be in opponent processing with me. You take a different bias, but we agree that we are each other's best means of self correction. That's how democracy should work, and we have degenerated it into adversarial. The other side is evil and must be destroyed because we are perfectly right and correct with a sinful, and I use that word advisedly, a sinful self-righteousness on both sides, a pox on both of your houses, I would say to that, because you're undermining the very opponent processing that is necessary for democracy to be a good means for us to use extended cognition to solve our complex problems. So that's how I'm strengthening your argument. That's what I meant to say. So thank you. <laughs> much. <laughs> I think look, much, look, much. Look, and it, go, it goes to something I said earlier. Stop trying to demonize or deify any one of your faculties. Yeah. Stop trying to demonize or deify Jordan. Confront his arguments, argument by argument. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Even his, some of his bad arguments need to be taken seriously because they're well-made and they contain insight. Some of the things you reject, but reject it because of the content of the argument, not because of the side you're on. What is that accomplishing, right? That is not accomplishing any overcoming of your or my self-deception. All it's doing is reinforcing whatever confirmation bias we are already enslaved to.